Yeah. Hi guys. It looks like it's getting to be a beautiful day here in the end times. We actually have a few puddles of water, unbelievably, outside here on Wednesday morning, October 28th, 2015, in the Santa Cruz Mountains in uh, California. So Wednesday morning is the day I bring you my weekly climate change meltdown roundup rant where I go on the pages of the mainstream media to see how this planet is heading directly into a burning lake of fire. Although as we're getting closer and closer to these bullshit uh, UN climate talks coming up, it's more and more my climate change meltdown roundup rants is how this planet is doing nothing to stop the planet from heading directly into a burning lake of fire. And we'll see if we wear out the, the uh, batteries on the bullshit detector button this morning. Okay, I want to start off, pick up today's rant where I left off last week's rant for the one or two people on the planet who made it to the end of my rant last week. The last story I covered was this absolutely hilarious story about that any agreement coming out of Paris of these, of these unadulterated uh, horseshit climate talks would have to include a global carbon tax. Th that any agreement that didn't isn't going to be worth the paper it's printed on. It's not going to be worth the paper it's printed on anyway. The, the last comment I made is we will see how long that idea lasts. Well, I guess it lasted about five days. It didn't even make it. The idea did not even make it uh, to December. As we found out here, uh, here on Reuters News, Climate change deal will not include global carbon price. Uh, what, what a shocking surprise. A climate change deal to be agreed in Paris in December will not be able to come up with a global carbon price. The United Nations climate chief, Chris, Christiana Figueres, said on Tuesday. That was the actually. So I guess it took six days. It took six days for them to, to shoot that idea down. So uh, I guess Al Gore will just have to think of some other way to pay for his vegan Thanksgiving feast in his 15,000 square foot mansion. Uh, I love uh, I love this story. <clears throat> multinational companies and investors and most recently oil majors have called for a global carbon price that was bullshit. Uh, <laughs> yeah uh, well maybe, maybe that is true maybe uh, BP whose profits fell what was it 90 percent last quarter are calling for a nickel a ton and Exxon are, is calling for four cents a ton and Shell is calling for three cents a ton. Uh, maybe that's the disagreement. But as long as we're talking uh, bullshit stories, are, are, are we ever going to, uh, are, are, are we ever going to get this this damn cockroach out of the mainstream media this bullshit here we go again how many times are they throwing this shit at us this from the Christian Science Monitor coming along with this story that I've already been over several times global rate of deforestation has been halved since the 1990s Minnie Mouse, would you like to have the honors? Uh, Jesus. 
Let's see. The world's forests are shrinking, but now at a slower rate, according to the United Nations. Yes, uh, according to the United Nations, the rate of deforestation is half what it was in the 1990s. Now, of course, over the past quarter century, forests have seen a net loss, but this is according to the UN, of some 319 million acres, an area just larger than South Africa. But between 2010 and 2015, an average of 0.08% of the world's forest was lost each year, down from 0.18% in the 1990s. This is some uh, UN forestry offer, officer, Kenneth McDicken. Quote, while people have become accustomed to bad news, there is some good news out there. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, let's see. Then, of course, we get way down uh, deep into this, and we see data for the UN study is self-reported by countries under the UN's jurisdiction. And this is one of these tree huggers, a Mr. Ellis, is skeptical about the reliability of such data. There you go. It can help tell the story of deforestation in individual countries, but monitoring by satellites and other external sources might describe global trends more accurately. Now, uh, there is one piece of the story that's not bullshit. That is not bullshit. And that's over there in Europe, as, as more and more of these farms have been abandoned, particularly since the fall of the Soviet Union, as people, as people have left the farms to move into these mega cities, all of these abandoned fields over the past 25 years have started to regenerate as Mother Nature has been taking her course. Or we can look at downtown Chernobyl, for instance, for an example of this. Uh, some of the recovery is from regrowth following abandonment of agricultural clear cuts. Uh, those lands were abandoned are now covered in regenerated forest. And uh, quoting this uh, forester, whoever this guy Ellis is, quote, the best way to get forests to regrow is to leave them alone. Okay. Okay, then we're just going to go down the list in no particular order. Okay, I love this one. This starts out sounding like good news, and, and, and the actual news kernel is good news. But then you start digging a little deeper and you start understanding how things work on this planet. From AP News, study on Arctic port for drilling support ships put on hold. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has suspended its study into building the first deep water port for large oil and gas support ships in the Arctic Ocean after Royal Dutch Shell ended its exploratory drilling off Alaska's northern coast. Shell's decision to halt drilling 
raised questions about the need for the port project aimed primarily at reducing cost for oil and gas vessels the Corps said in a statement Monday, and, and, and if, if there's any doubt about what, what's going on here, uh, if there's anyone who thinks that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers ha has uh, put this, this thing on the back burner, and they have not killed it, they have put it on the back burner, is due to any sort of Barack Obama environmental legacy. Got one thing to tell you. It has everything to do with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers playing step and fetch it to these multinational oil and gas corporations. So in some uh, probably trillion dollar uh, oil and gas corporation based in Europe doesn't need a, a port the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, supported by your tax dollars, uh, doesn't need to play step and fetch it. But don't worry, they're just they're they're just putting it on the back burner uh, for a year, uh, and and then come back to revisit it uh, in in a month. Uh, to see if to see if the oil companies are wanting them to play step and fetch it again. So then they start talking about these. Uh, I, I love these. This is one of those bullshit uh, planet eaters from Alaska named Joy Baker. Uh, quote. This is the last sentence in the story for the for the laugh of the day. We believe there is a broader purpose for the port facility than just the economic benefit of the oil and gas industry. There, there is one, there is one reason for that planet-eating seaport. It is for the economic benefit of the oil and gas industry who completely owns uh, the goddamn U.S. Army Corps of Engineers because it owns, it owns the United States government. <clears throat> Jesus. Next. Nearly half of Senate challenges Obama's carbon rules. You know, I was kind of talking about this in my rant last night uh, about the, these right-wing planet eaters down there in Brazil complaining that Dilma Rousseff is not a big enough planet eater. So they're trying to get her impeached. It, it, we have the same thing going on in this country. Uh, all of this bickering and infighting uh, where it, it, here we have Barack Obama uh, for his environmental legacy uh, acting like he's saving this planet by, by some sort of new stringent pollution controls on new coal-fired power plants built in the U.S. You notice that he is not outlawing uh, coal-fired power plants in the U.S. He's just putting new smokestacks on them, which is a joke in and of itself, but at least it's a tiny little effort to delay the collapse of a planet by a year or two, but the, these goddamn right-wing uh, planet-eating Republicans won't even uh, let him get away with that. Nearly half of the U.S. Senate supports a resolution to challenge the Obama administration's regulation cutting carbon emissions from power plants, the core of the United States' broader climate change strategy. And, uh, of course, uh, it, it is Kentucky Republican Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell 
leading that fight as uh, and of course Barack Obama is just going to uh, veto it anyway and I love this uh, moving down to the bottom uh, McConnell and other opponents of climate change regulations in Congress have tried to assert their influence on a Paris outcome by sowing doubt among other countries about the United States' ability to achieve its own targets, and, and that's exactly what they're doing. Uh, th these UN climate talks are already a joke, and, and, and this is exactly what these planet eaters are doing. They're, they're, they're showing that right here in the U.S. we can't even come to any sort of an agreement, you know? Moving along. We're still talking about these horseshit climate talks. Climate envoys should try harder after Paris. Poorer nations say. I, I, I love how Reuters uh, words this one. <clears throat> the global push to fight climate change must intensify after a major meeting in Paris said poorer nations on Tuesday who are reconciled to disappointment in any upcoming deal. Reconciled to disappointment. Yes, and so they are actually asking uh, mostly these island nations which have no chance like the Marshall Islands and people like that. They're actually uh, have some horseshit idea about uh, these talks limiting the planet to a one and a half Celsius degree rise. Climate negotiators should not abandon hope of limiting global temperature rises to below one and a half degrees. Even if targets on the table for Paris are less ambitious, well, they're aiming for two, but they already admit that what they've come up with is they're calling three. Uh, Jesus. Come on. All right. What does the future look like for the Persian Gulf? Over the next few decades, there are several articles on this. Uh, every one of the news services had their spin on this. This is AP's spin on this story. An intolerable, unimaginable heat forecast for the Persian Gulf. If carbon dioxide emissions continue at their current pace, by the end of the century, Parts of the Persian Gulf will sometimes be just too hot for the human body to tolerate, a new study says. How hot? The heat index, which combines heat and humidity, may hit 165 to 170 degrees for at least six hours according to numerous computer simulations in the new study. I don't know if they're talking about six hours straight one time in a year or every day for three months. It never says. But anyway, it, it almost doesn't matter because that is so hot that the human body can't get rid of the heat. The elderly and ill are hurt most by current heat waves, but the future is expected to be so hot that healthy, fit people will be endangered, health experts say. While humans have been around, Earth has not seen 
that type of prolonged oppressive combination of heat and humidity. This would be the type of heat that would make the deadly heat wave in Europe in 2003 that killed more than 70,000 people, quote, look like a refreshing day, said study co-author Jeremy Powell of Loyola University. Yep, 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 yep. Here is uh, how the University of California, we all just wind up here in California because I got to get out there and get her done. So uh, this is how the University of California is going to save the planet. Reducing the human carbon footprint is a, quote, moral imperative. <clears throat> UC President Janet Napolitano said Tuesday as she vowed to turn the system's 10 campuses into a living laboratory for solutions that can be scaled up to state, national, and global levels. Y yes, uh, it, it, of course. Quote, I anticipate that by the year 2025, this is 10 years from now, I anticipate that by 2025, when the University of California is carbon neutral, that the rest of the world in seeking climate solutions will say, well, let's go back to 2015 when they had that summit at UC San Diego and let's see if we can do what the University of California did. I'm sure that is what the rest of the planet in the year 2025 is going to have on their mind is some uh, UC California study. And, and uh, so, of course, our planet saving governor, uh, Jerry Brown, here in California, uh, he has something to say about California and the planet. <clears throat> Quote While California is not a planet, it is still a global leader, and what we do will be disseminated. So at least Jerry Brown has figured out that he is not the dictator of the world because California is not a planet. Thank you for explaining that to us, Jerry. We, we might not have figured that out on our own. But anyway, well, oh shit, I was going to do some article, then I, but I forgot to flag it about the snow leopard. The snow leopard is just one more species we can kiss goodbye over the next few, over the next few decades. So, bye-bye, Mr. Snow Leopard. Anyway, uh, Minnie and I are going to wrap up our weekly climate meltdown roundup rant for Wednesday, October 28, 2015, because I got to get out there and get her done, and Minnie Mouse has to dance. Dancing into the end times. Might as well at this point, Minnie.